Let me talk about the revolution of Frege in philosophy. Uh, this is much harder to pin down because the revolution is much more diffuse and Frege's influence is more diffuse. So it's, it's much harder to track, but nonetheless, it's clearly there. So let me talk about the revolution in philosophy. It's kind of a truism amongst people who know about 20th century philosophy that it's marked by something called the linguistic turn. Um, and what that means is kind of contentious, but it means that for the first time, really, in the history of philosophy, philosophers started to worry about the way that language works. And indeed, the analysis of the way that language works becomes absolutely central to how philosophy is managed in the 20th century. People disagree about how it works. People disagree about how to manage it. But, but if you look at all the great traditions of philosophy in the 20th century, they're all kind of... Um, the philosophy of language is absolutely key to them, whether it's the logical positivists, whether it's uh, deconstructionists, whether it's uh, um, Oxford ordinary language philosophy... The way that language functions is absolutely central to philosophy in the 20th century. Whether we're through that period now, you know, who knows, it's too soon to tell. But it's certainly true of the 20th century. Now, it was not like that before Frege. So the relationship between thought and reality is a traditional philosophical problem going back 2,000 years. And people worried about the relationship between thought and reality. Is reality independent of thought? Uh, or does thought, in some sense, help construct reality? You know, these are standard debates in, in philosophy before the 20th century. But what Frege did was say, oh, hang on, you can't just think of it as a two-way relation. You've got to think there, there are three things which are really important here, not just thought and reality, but language as well. And you're never going to get this relationship straight unless you get these relationships straight as well. So... Frege put the analysis of language squarely on the philosophical map. Um, so he's, in a sense, responsible for the linguistic turn in philosophy. Now, it's a bit more complex than that, and I'll come back to that, but let me just explain how Frege got to do this, why he did this, and what he did. So Frege was not a philosopher, um, but he came to appreciate the necessity of understanding how language works precisely because he was driven to understand the difference between a name and a quantifier. And the more he started to think about um, the way that language works, the more he got into a serious articulation of the function of language. Um, and I think it's fair to say that Frege was the first person in the history of Western thought who produced a sustained and rigorous analysis of the way that meaning works in language. So this guy is um, 20 years before Saussure, uh, let alone Chomsky. Um, and what Frege did was done in just a couple of small papers. So unlike the big book, uh, he wrote a number of small papers on the way that language works. These are two of the most important uh, Ubersinn und Bedeutung, on sense and reference, and Überbegriff und Gegenstand, concept and object. So these were some of his key, category, key linguistic semantic categories. So let me explain those to you. First thing about Frege is he said that subjective mental states have nothing to do with meaning. Now, in this, he was going right against the grain of whatever traditions there were in the philosophy of language before that, because the people who talked just a little bit about meaning before Frege, like Locke, thought that the meaning of something is just the mental image it conjures up in your mind. And that's crazy, Frege said. And this is, you know, nearly every philosopher of language in the 20th century has followed Frege down that path, meaning whatever it is has not got anything to do with the image in your head, which may or may not be conjured up when you hear the word. So, You've got to give an analysis of language which avoids appeal to subjective mental images. OK, well, um, let's look at a couple of um, Frege's insights. So take these two sentences. The morning star is the morning star. 
The morning star is the evening star. Now, both those are true, okay? Um, and because the morning star is the evening star, well, then the object referred to on the right-hand side of both those equations is identical. However, that one seems kind of trivial, right? Everyone knows the morning star is the morning star. That the morning star is the evening star was presumably a substantial astronomical discovery by the Babylonians or whoever it was. I don't really know. So how come these things can be so significantly different when you know, the thing referred to on the right-hand side is the same thing? Well, Frege said, you've got to distinguish between the meaning, the sense, and the thing referred to. So the morning star and the evening star have the same reference, the same, they refer to the same thing, but they have different senses. Where the sense is something like the mode with which the object is presented. So it's a kind of conceptual route, as it were, to get at the object referred to by the name. So um, that sense and reference, that's one of Frege's crucial distinctions. The other is between concept and object. Take this sentence, Alice is happy. Now that's a perfectly fine sentence, right? What about this one? Or those two? Alice Brad, not really a sentence. Is happy is sad, not really a sentence. So you can't just get a sentence by splicing together any two old phrases. You've got to have a noun phrase and you've got to have a verb phrase. But how is it they function together to produce a single thing, namely the thought that Alice is happy. How, you know, do the parts fit together? I mean, obviously they do fit together, but what does it mean to fit together in this way? Well, Frege said that Alice refers to an object and is happy refers to a quite different kind of thing, namely a concept and concepts are completely different from objects. Concepts have gaps in them in some metaphorical sense. And that the reason that Alice is happy fits together is that you've got a concept with a gap in it, and along comes the object, and it fills the gap. So we have a kind of metaphysical distinction between two quite distinct kinds of things, objects and concepts. And they must be radically different. Their behaviour must be radically different. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to explain how come some things fit together and some things don't? So Alice Brad doesn't fit together because you know, Brad hasn't got a gap in it to be filled. And is happy, is round, doesn't fit together because is round's got a gap in it, but is happy is not the kind of thing that can fit it. So if you put um, this pair of dichotomies together you get a very general picture. And it, in its simplest form, it looks like this. Um, consider noun phrases and verb phrases. They refer to different kinds of things. Noun phrases refer to objects. Verb phrases refer to concepts. And that's their referent. But all words have not only, a, not only a referent, but a sense. And what is the sense? Well, in each case, the sense is the mode of presentation of the object or the mode of presentation of the concept. Okay, so this is sort of the guts of Frege's philosophy of language, or theory of semantics in a nutshell. And, although it may not be obvious to you, that gives you an account of the metaphysical structure of reality. So you might have thought you were doing semantics here, and you are. But in fact, it involves a kind of metaphysical taxonomy of the kinds of things that there are in reality. And what Frege said is, hey... There's at least two kinds of different kinds of things in reality. All right. So, we come back to that in a minute. But uh, this was Frege's theory of semantics in a nutshell. And um, it didn't have the effect that his logic had. So, as I explained to you just now, the logic has become entirely orthodox. You open any first year textbook, you will find Frege's logic. Uh, this is not true of his theory of semantics. Virtually no one will accept Frege's theory of semantics now. In fact, there really isn't much consensus on semantics at the moment. There are still a number of very different schools which argue about how semantics works. So Frege's effect was not to make 
a view canonical. Frege's effect was to put the theory of meaning centre stage so that his work was taken up and it was deployed uh, by subsequent thinkers uh, inaugurating the linguistic term. Now, Frege, of course, was not the only philosopher who was instrumental in causing the linguistic turn. Um, this one is another one, Edmund Husserl. So, Frege and Husserl are both end of the 19th century thinkers uh, whose work, above anything else, has served to define 20th century philosophy. Uh, and they are both responsible for putting philosophy of language right at the centre of things. But Husserl was a little bit younger than Frege, and in fact, um, Husserl's first book was on the philosophy of arithmetic, a kind of thing that Frege was interested in. And he published this book, and it drew a quite very severe rebuke in a review from Frege, who pointed out a number of the problems with it. Um, at this time, Husserl was still working with the idea that you can think of numbers as kind of mental entities, subjective mental images, and Frege was already dead against that. So Frege published this critique of the first book by Husserl um, and made Husserl change his mind. So in his next book, Logical Investigations, um, Husserl completely rejected the psychologistic ideas that he'd had in his earlier book and went to work on something which got rid of all these psychological elements from his account of arithmetic. Now, um, he didn't reproduce Frege. Uh, he didn't rewrite Frege, but nonetheless, Frege's impact on him was immense. Um, both of them, Husserl and Frege, developed an account of meaning, but the, meanings were quite, the accounts of meaning were quite different. For Frege, I've already talked about, he used his work in logic to develop a bunch of logical tools, whereas what Husserl developed was something called phenomenology. And phenomenology is an analysis of the objective structure of thought, not kind of fleeting mental images, but the objective structure that mental representations must have. That's why it's got something to do with meaning. Um, so their solutions to the problem of meaning are very different. And interestingly enough, um, both of these have sort of gone their own ways since Frege and Husserl died. So this side has been very influential in English-speaking philosophy. This side has been much more influential in German and French-speaking philosophy. So as some of you may know, there's supposedly a division between analytic and continental philosophy. Well, to the extent there's a division... This is kind of the branch point. Um, notice, though, that both these guys were, well, um, German-speaking. So its origins were in Germany. How come this took hold in the English-speaking world and this remains in the German-speaking world? Um, the answer is, of course, complex, but there's one word which captures much of it, much of it and that's Nazism. Because... Many of the guys who worked down this side of the street tended to be either Jewish or very left-wing. And, of course, they had a bit of a rough time in the Third Reich. So a number of them, at least those that weren't wiped out, said, we're off. And they emigrated. Most of them ended up in the US. Um, and so they had most of their influence in the US. So this is how this conceptual division became a kind of geographical division as well to the extent that it is. Um, anyway, I just wanted to point out that the linguistic turn was not... Um, there, there are other people who are very much involved in the linguistic turn, like Husserl, but even in the case of Husserl, whose work in the end was very different from Frege, Frege played a crucial role in getting Husserl out of his original psychologism into what he eventually got into. OK, so that's the two revolutions that Frege initiated or had a hand in initiating. One was in logic, one was in the philosophy of language. And both of these things have been absolutely dead central to 20th century thought, both mathematics, logic, computer science, and philosophy on the other. All right. Now let me just say a few more words about the Frege conundrum. Because... Uh, 
as I said, one part of the conundrum is that Frege died thinking his life's work had been a failure. And, and so it was. I mean, you know, his magnum opus had crashed and crashed big time. But the tools that he developed along the way took on a life of their own, uh, which I don't think he ever came to appreciate. That's part of the conundrum. But there's another part of the conundrum, and that's this. Frege was not translated into English until the 1960s. No one in the English-speaking world, in fact, no one in the world, read Frege until you know, some of the stuff was translated in the 1960s and 1970s. And by that time, these two great conceptual revolutions were well and truly you know, underway and gone through. You know, they'd taken place by the 1920s, if not before. So how did Frege have this influence when no one read him? That's another part of the conundrum. Well, the answer is that his ideas were transmitted by other people. So let's take logic first. Um, I'm sorry the picture's a bit grainy, but this is Bertrand Russell looking a bit older than he did in the earlier photograph. So Russell was working on ideas that were similar to Frege, you know, 20, 30 years after Frege, or 10, 20 years after Frege, um, and he had the same idea as Frege, logicism. He had a different way of going about the project. It failed just as much in the end. But Russell read Frege and took up many of Frege's ideas. And it was through the work of Russell that people appreciated Frege's ideas. Now, Russell is, plays, certainly is frank about what he's taken from Frege. Um, but as is often the case, people don't go back and read the original, but they just, you know, uh, they, what, when they think they know the answer, they don't need to go back to the original, they just take um, whatever they need. Um, and one of the reasons that people did not go back to Frege, who got quietly forgotten in the process, was because of the notation that Frege used. So his book was called The Begriffschrift, called The Concept Notation, and it looks something like this. Oh, Prinkeeping Mathematica was Russell's work in 1910 when he espoused logicism. Forgot that, never mind. This is the Begriff Shift, concept notation. And probably, unless you're a mathematician or a logician, this would look just as opaque as all the squiggles I put up before. Um, but if you're a mathematician, there's a world of difference. Because you can see, I think, that Frege's notation is two-dimensional whereas standard mathematical notation is just one-dimensional. Equations are written on a single line. And generally speaking, mathematicians and logicians find it much easier to read things which are written in two dimension, one dimension, sorry, on a straight line, than two that cross the page. So this nota- or the, the Russell's notation was not actually his own. He borrowed that from an Italian mathematician called Peano. But nonetheless, people couldn't read Frege. It was just too difficult to get their head around. And so it was actually Russell that had an impact on the subsequent developments in logic, not Frege, even though you know, Russell himself was reacting to and taking over a lot of Frege's ideas. So it's Russell's work, for example, that goes into Hilbert School, which is the direct line of transmission. So that's one reason why Frege's work wasn't really recognised. The acknowledgements were there for people to follow up, but they just didn't. Okay. The story in philosophy is really quite different. Um, Russell's work, sorry, Frege's work in philosophy was transmitted not by Russell, but by this guy, whose name I would guess that most educated people know, Wittgenstein. And Wittgenstein was heavily influenced by Frege. Uh, in particular, in this book, The Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, which is one of the great classics of 20th century philosophy. And on another occasion, we could talk about Wittgenstein, who's a much sexier figure than Frege, but in some sense, that's not part of the story today. So, Wittgenstein was very heavily influenced by Frege. But Wittgenstein, unlike Russell, didn't cite his sources. So, um, this is part of the introduction to the Tractatus. I don't wish to judge how far my efforts coincide with those of other philosophers. Indeed, what I've written here makes no claim to novelty in detail. Well, that's not true. 
Uh, and the reason why I give no sources is that it's a matter of indifference to me whether the thoughts that I have had have have had have, and been anticipated by someone else. I will only mention that I'm indebted to Frege's great works and to the writings of my friend Mr Bertram Russell for much of the stimulation of my thought. This is coy. Um, Wittgenstein was heavily influenced by Frege and it's only in recent years that the correspondence between Frege has come to light but they had a substantial correspondence which they didn't agree. I mean, the Tractatus is not Frege Wittgenstein is different. Um, but nonetheless, it spins off Frege's work, and this correspondence that Frege and Wittgenstein had was crucial into the formation of the Tractatus. And in fact, although Wittgenstein doesn't explain that, because he's not the kind of thing he does, it's clear to anyone with the eyes to see it that the metaphysical picture that you get in the Tractatus is really an attempt to work out some of the problems that Frege had run up against when he was working out his philosophy of language. So the Wittgensteinian distinctions between sense and reference, sorry, between uh, saying and showing, between the various kinds of nonsense, these are all responses to problems that I haven't talked about that Frege found. So the Tractatus is a deeply inspired Fregean book, but Wittgenstein doesn't give his sources. So people read Wittgenstein and not Frege. But the Tractatus was indeed one of the most influential books in the history of 20th century philosophy. So Frege's influence in philosophy was not transmitted because people couldn't go back and read the original. It was transmitted because they didn't know really where to go and see. And it wasn't until the work was translated into English in the 1960s that people started to understand the kind of influence that Frege had had. So there are two conundrums concerning Frege. The first was the fact that his life's work ended in failure and yet he caused two major intellectual revolutions. And the sec second kind of conundrum or irony of Frege's life is that the roles he'd played in these revolutions were not even recognised until 40 years after his death, by which time, no, the revolutions were well established. So, in some ways, Frege is a tragic figure. In some ways, he's an heroic figure. And there really aren't many figures of his status or calibre in the history of Western thought. Let me, let me end by quoting a little bit more of Bertrand Russell. The correspondence between Frege and Russell, which triggered the collapse of Frege's magnum opus, was itself not published until the 1960s. No one was interested in Frege until the 1960s. But uh, Eventually, an editor wrote to Russell and said, well, look, we'd like to, like to publish your correspondence with Frege. Will you give us permission? And the editor was a man called Van Heinort, and Russell wrote this. I should be most pleased if you would publish the correspondence between Frege and myself, and I'm grateful to you for your suggesting this. As I think about acts of integrity and grace... I realise that there is nothing in my knowledge to compare with Frege's dedication to truth. His entire life's work was on the verge of completion. Much of his work had been ignored to the benefit of men infinitely less capable. His second volume was about to be published, and upon finding that his fundamental assumption was in error, he responded with intellectual pleasure, clearly submerging any feelings of personal disappointment. It was almost superhuman and a telling indication of that of which men are capable if their dedication is to creative work and knowledge instead of crude efforts to dominate and be known. And I think there's a lesson for all of us there. Thank you.